Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Katie Sacra, and I will be your host this for this very important GFPD webinar, Patient-Focused Drug Development for Paroxysomal Disorders. What is it, and how can you be a part of it? We will be answering questions at the end, but please go ahead and submit your questions at any time during the webinar. You can do this in the box located beneath the webinar player window, or I'll be monitoring the chat box, so feel free to just put your questions right into the chat box if you'd like. Tonight, we have Dr. Mosami Bose presenting, who is no stranger to our community, but for anyone who may not have had the pleasure to have met her, Dr. Bose is an assistant professor at the Department of Nutrition and Food Studies at Montclair State University. She is also a GFPD medical and scientific advisor. Dr. Mosami Bose is the mother of Alan Betzer, who was born with a severe form of PBD ZSD and lost his battle in 2011 to PBD ZSD. Through her experience with her son, Dr. Bose joined the GFPD as the medical and scientific research liaison in 2012. Her work with the GFPD has resulted in the first GFPD research grant cycle, as well as the first treatment guidelines for PBD ZSD, which has shown to be an invaluable resource for families affected by PBD ZSD, like my own family and so many of you listening tonight. Her long-term goal is to conduct patient family-centered research in rare metabolic diseases, such as PBD ZSD. Dr. Bose is passionate about continuing to learn about paroxysomal disorders and other rare diseases and helping other rare disease families by using her knowledge and her experience. Mosami, thank you again for being with us tonight, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Katie, for that really lovely introduction. Um, I don't see you guys, but it's um, I, I see that people are coming on, and I'm very appreciative of everybody being here tonight. Um, the whole purpose of me talking tonight is really uh, to sort of highlight this uh, this research opportunity uh, related to patient-focused drug development um, and give you guys a little bit of an idea of like what it is and how um, you can participate in this particular research opportunity. Um, so I'm going to just take a couple slides to just go go through an overview of what this is and then what it, you know what's going to happen next. Um, here is oh goodness. Here's my agenda for tonight. You know, I'm just going to talk just a little bit about what um, uh, patient-focused drug development is, and that's this acronym that I've presented here, um, uh, PFDD. The EL stands for Externally Led uh, Patient-Focused Drug Development, which basically just means that uh, the GFPD is going to be the major uh, sponsor of this patient-focused drug development initiative, but it's going to be overseen uh, by the FDA who has uh, previously run a lot of PFD initiative, PFDD initiatives, which we'll, we'll talk about in just a second. Um, so I'm gonna talk about what PFDD is, why it's important um, you know, to families like ours, um, how uh, as a family member uh, to a patient with a paroxysomal disorder um, can participate in uh, the efforts that the G GFPD has undertaken uh, towards ELPFDD, and then give some specific action items. Primarily, um, I'm going to ask you to complete a Google form that I'll give you a link to at the end of this talk, um, where you can express interest in participating um, in some of our sessions and give us your availability uh, to participate. And then obviously I'll be happy to take any questions that you guys have at the end of this presentation. So Katie already did a, a really nice job um, introducing me. So I'm not gonna spend too much time um, on this slide, but um, I am currently um, a member of the scientific advisory board of the GFPD. And I have also joined in the last year, the diversity committee. Um, at Montclair State, I do uh, I teach classes and I do research primarily um, on rare pediatric diseases. I like to look at the caregiver perspective because that's who I was, um, as well as um, I have a background in nutrition. So I was really interested in looking at the role of nutrition in uh, rare diseases like CSD. Um, and then over the last year, I started really getting into um, this ELPFDD uh, approach with another rare disease. And I kind of, I, last year at the conference, I, I brought this ELPFDD idea to the attention of the GFPD. And I'm really grateful for all the efforts they've um, done to um, allow this to happen and ask me to be a part of it. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. So again, ELPFDD stands for Externally Led Patient Focused Drug Development. And this is, you know, this webinar is going to give you a little bit of information about what that is and then how you can be a, a 
part of it. So this is an initiative that was started by the FDA uh, to really capture the patient perspective of the specific populations that they are they were uh, they are interested in. And um, we have reached out to the FDA and asked them to that you know to give us give us the green light to. Uh, to conduct one of these patient-focused drug development initiatives, and they have done that, and so we're going to go ahead and get started with it. So, what we're really doing is, you know, starting this initiative to get the patient and family perspective of people living with a paroxysomal uh, disorder. And you're going to hear me say a lot of um, a lot of words about what ELPFDD is. Uh, the details of it, and you'll he'll probably hear me say it kind of over and over again in different ways. And really, I just, you know, what in that sort of capturing of that patient perspective, in that family perspective of the prox of what it's like to live with a proxosomal disorder, what you're going to be doing is, you know, giving the FDA very crucial information on how to design clinical trials. And that's really the end game here is you are, it, by participating in this, you are giving important information that only you have as either the patient or the caregiver of a child with a proxis, of a patient with a proxisomal disorder um, by sharing your story, what your experience has been like. And, you know, this is, you know, this is a really, really important opportunity uh, to be able to do that in a way where the FDA, members of the FDA, and these are the people that are responsible for therapeutic approval, you know, doing that while they are in the room um, and quite possibly literally in the room while you are giving this information. Um, so this is your chance to share your story directly with the FDA to let them know these are the types of treatments that we need. Um, and these are the things that we want to improve um, in ourselves or in our loved ones with proxisomal disorders. So what this looks like is what this patient-focused uh, drug development initiative looks like is um, it starts with collection of preliminary data. And that's really what's coming up soon is um, the uh, organization of our uh, preliminary focus groups with uh, caregivers and uh, possibly patients if they're able to uh, communicate about what it's like to live with a proxisomal disorder. Once we get all of that data, the ideas to collect about, you know, the um, uh, information from about 30 participants from these focus groups, uh, we want to use that information to build out a larger preliminary survey that we can distribute uh, to more people to, again, capture that experience of what it's like to live with a proxisomal disorder. And I'll talk about the details of like what what it's like to live like live with a paroxysomal disorder entails, like what specific type of information that they that the FDA is looking for. Um, and then once we collect that preliminary information through the focus groups and the um, and the uh, and the survey, we are going to be conducting a uh, a meeting um, that is focused on ELPFDD, and this is going to sort of happen in conjunction with the summit summer 2024 conference, the G GFPD um, Family and Scientific Conference. And the primary goal of this meeting is to have this sort of town hall kind of discussion um, to hear directly from patients and caregivers about their perspectives on living with a paroxysomal disorder what their experiences are with treatments and what you know what needs to be taken into account when new uh, drugs, new therapeutics are coming up for um, paroxysomal disorders within that research pipeline. Um, you know, the FDA is learning more and more that this patient and family perspective is critical in helping the FDA understand the context in which these types of approval decisions are made for new drugs, new therapeutics, new gene therapies, new, um, uh, new medical products. Um, so once that, once that meeting is done and we've collected all this information from both preliminary data as well as the, um, um, the meeting itself, it's all gonna culminate in the writing of this, uh, what's called the voice of the patient report, where we summarize all of this information and we give it to the FDA. And now the FDA will have it so that when a new um, a drug starts to come through the pipeline, we already, you know, this voice of the patient is really meant to serve as somewhat of a blueprint of how do we design clinical trials, trials keeping that patient, keeping that um, family perspective in mind what's important to them. So 
bottom line, you know, the what you're going to be doing is, in participating in this is playing a very significant role in the overall drug development process. You will be giving the FDA information on what is it like to live with a processomal disorder on a day-to-day -day basis. You will be giving the FDA information on how do you currently manage uh, the symptoms um, and the other aspects of uh, daily life with living with a paroxysomal disorder and what is in, important to you. If there were a new drug, a new therapeutic that were available, what would you want to see that clinical trial and what uh, look like and what would you want to see that therapeutic do? Um, so this is, you know, I cannot, you know, I cannot uh, stress enough you know, what an important role that you as, um, you know, either the caregiver or a patient with a proxosomal disorder, um, what you, that role that you play in informing um, that dr um, drug development process. So you're, like I said, you're going to hear me say this kind of like over and over again in different ways, because I really want to hammer in this idea is we need your participation um, in, in the process. But these three bullet points that you see here is kind of like an overview of the type of information that we will be trying to capture in this ELPFDD process. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context and a little bit of background, and, and I, don't, I don't wanna spend too much time on it um, because we don't have a lot of time. And also I'm not in, in, like the expert in this process, but I'm learning as, I'm, uh, as I continue to do research uh, in this space. Um, but the FDA, the FDA itself does not actually conduct clinical trials, does not um, execute clinical trials. It, it doesn't do any of the boots of the ground stuff, but they are responsible for approving the entire drug development process. And I'll talk about that process in a second. And um, like I said, you know, this input that you give through participating in this ELP FDD process will give the in FDA really important information to help them make their decisions as to whether or not a therapeutic should be approved um, and whether or not it will actually have a meaningful impact on the paroxysomal disorder community. So having this voice of the patient report that's going to you know, really document this preliminary data that we're collecting, um, as well as the meeting, the, the discussions during the meeting itself, once we have that sort of uh, essentially a blueprint for what's needed in clinical trials, this may le lead to treatments that are more meaningful to you and your loved one with a paroxysomal disorder. And it having that blueprint already in place may lead to faster approvals for treatments for paroxysomal disorders. Um, so this is a really important opportunity. And some may say this is your only opportunity to directly connect with the FDA and have your voice heard as to what it's like to live with a paroxysomal disorder. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, some contextual stuff, the drug development process, and like how all of this stuff got started. Uh, to give the, a little bit of that hi historical context, this the whole over the whole drug development process, which I'll I'll show you a little um, image in just a second of of that process. That whole process, historically, the patient voice, the community voice, the target population voice has not been really incorporated into that process until it's time to recruit for these clinical trials, and then you need you know patient. Um, patient input and community input to participate in these clinical trials. But in not doing that, the FDA has realized that oftentimes when, you know, when they, you know, when they just simply rely on the clinicians and the researchers who obviously have extremely important insight into how, you know, the, um, you know, the, the medical workings of specific diseases, as well as, you know, research design and clinical trial design, all of that information is extremely important. But if you just rely on that and don't incorporate that patient voice, that community voice, what ends up happening is that sometimes there is FDA approval for treatments um, of aspects of a disease that aren't really that important uh, to patients. And there may be a compliance issue. There may be a lot of issues when you, you made a drug that really nobody really cares one way or the other if, if they're on it. Um, you know, and, and not incorpor incorporating that patient voice without going into a lot of details because that'll just be a, a whole other web webinar has led to the failure of a lot of clinical trials. Um, so the FDA has realize that they uh, and they recognize now that they need this community input throughout 
every step of the drug development process. So that's why we're doing this PFDD now, because, you know, as we get moved towards um, uh, finding new therapeutics for proxosomal disorders, if we already have this in place, like I said before, this may lead to faster approvals for therapeutics for proxosomal disorders. Um, so they started this program in 2012, where the FDA conducted, you know, meetings with different disease communities to get, um, you know, as a way to, as a, um, as a systematic approach to help ensure that the patient's experiences, the perspectives, their needs, and their priorities um, are, are meaningfully captured and incorporated into the drug development process and the overall evaluation before a drug went to approval. And then as a way to sort of expand out their scope, because the FDA, you know, they have limited a number of people that can be involved in conducting these meetings, they, and also recognizing that, you know, patient advocacy groups, um, they have a lot of impact on the overall disease community. Um, in 2015, they started doing, um, initiating these uh, externally led patient focused drug development programs where they didn't conduct the meetings, the patient groups uh, conducted the meetings, but uh, the EL, the program itself was approved by the FDA, and there were frequent meetings with the FDA to ensure that they that the patient group was on track with hitting those FDA goals and incorporating that patient voice. So let's talk very briefly about the drug development process. And so in all of these steps, now that's that's really what this ELPFDD is meant to inform every single step of the drug uh, development process, starting from new drug discovery where a researcher, um, you know, uses, you know, goes through many channels uh, to discover new drugs. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of ways that that happens, but once there is that discover that discovery process happens, then uh, there is this effort to go through these uh, steps that are overseen by the FDA. And that's really what the FDA does. They as oversee these steps and they approve, you know, sort of movement from one stage of the drug development process uh, to another. So once they go through the cell and the animal studies on this, uh, you know, new, this new drug that has been discovered um, through a number of different processes, they may, they will submit it, what's called an IND or an investigational new drug application to the FDA. And once the FDA greenlights that, then they go through the, the, the phases of the clinical trials that involve humans. And each phase is meant to address a certain aspect of taking that particular drug or therapeutic. So the phase one is looking at safety and metabolism. Phase two is the sort of proof of concept showing that it is effective with whatever outcomes ha have been identified as important for that um, for that population. Phase three is sort of after you've developed that proof of concept, really expanding it out into a large uh, scale clinical trial that is that may be placebo controlled, maybe randomized to, um, you know, to increase the validity of those studies. Um, and, and then and then after that, um, after the results of the phase three clinical trial goes through, then there is what's called a new drug application submission that goes into the FDA. And the FDA reviews it and sees, and at that point, um, and this is a very oversimplified um, uh, description of the process. It's much more, um, it's much longer than I'm describing here, and there's a lot more other details involved. Um, but the FDA, once they they gather up to that phase three clinical uh, trial data, then they go ahead and um, approve it to go to market. But there's throughout the entire process. You know, they're, you know, like I said, phase one is dealing with safety. It's not like they stop looking at safety when they get to phase two. They're constantly monitoring and evaluating um, the safety, the metabolism, the effectiveness, and other sort of aspects of that, of, uh, you know, utilizing that drug as a therapeutic um, as it is getting closer and closer to market. So the purpose of the, um, the PFDD is really to be involved in every single step of this process. And when when you decide to participate in this PFD process, PFDD process, you will be asked, you know, what are some side effects that are not that are, you know, uh, deal breakers? What are the different outcomes do you want to see? Do you want to see less seizures? Do you want to see, um, you know, do you want to see uh, uh, your patient being able to walk better, being able to communicate better? You know, so this PFDD process will inform every single stage of this drug development process um, instead of previously where it was just sort of incorporated into that um, that recruitment strategy and not uh, not much else. Um, 
so that's my like two second uh, overview of the uh, of the drug development process. And um, and hopefully when we get closer to the meeting itself, I can go into a little bit more detail of what that process entails and really what is important in this uh, in um, in informing the FDA through this PFDD effort. Um, so again, I'm uh, repeating what I said before, but now that I, I want to sort of repeat it again in the context of you know you kind of understanding the the drug uh, development process. There's three major things that a PFD an ELPFDD tries to address, um, and we do this through the surveys, we do this through the, through the focus groups, and we'll do this through the town hall discussion session at the ELPFDD meeting in summer 2024. Um, they will ask you, um, um, you know, when we're collecting data, we will ask you what are the symptoms that are the most impactful of um, living with a paroxysomal disorder, and not just what are the symptoms, but also um, the what are the impacts of the symptoms and just having and the disease overall. How does it affect daily activities of living? When I was doing an ELPFDD before for another rare disease group, um, I had somebody talk to me about how their child had, uh, for example, uh, a specific type of seizure called drop seizures, where you know they just they just drop that when they have a seizure and. Um, and as a result, they had like broken bones. Um, they had a lot of physical harm that was done uh, done as a result of these seizures. And as a result of that, the parents decided that they didn't want their child to walk anymore because they were afraid that they would have a drop seizure. So now the seizures are affecting their mobility. Um, and it's those types of impacts that are extremely important uh, to communicate and share with the FDA. Um, the FDA also wants to know what are the current treatments that are being used for proxosomal disorders um, and what's working, what is managing certain symptoms, and you know, what are the side effects, what are some problems with current, um, current treatments. And then sort of letting that kind of segue into, okay, if there were a new drug um, that, that was going to be tested um, for approval to go through that whole drug development process, what would uh, patients and families like to see improve um, with, um, with treatment? How would, you, uh, how would you prioritize what a clinical trial should look like? Um, so that's really talking about clinical outcomes. What types of outcomes are you looking for that would be ideal for you as the patient or uh, the caregiver of a patient with a proxosomal disorder? Um, what's, what's, what matters to you? And then going even more granular and more detailed into, okay, um, if there were a treatment, how, you know, are there any, is there anything off the table in terms of how it's administered? Do you not, do, will your patient not do shots? Will they do, will, can they not do it orally? You know, and how long, you know, how frequent do you have, if you have to give it four times a day, would you do it? Um, you know, and how long these treatments are, what would be, like I said, deal breakers for, for you as a patient or a caregiver of a patient with a proxosomal disorder? And then even more granular, talking about if you were to participate in a, in a clinical trial, um, how long can it be? Um, would you, how far would you travel? Um, those types of details is, you know, are, this is all of these things are what the FDA wants to know. Um, and then, you know, and like I said, what could be better? What would be your ideal clinical trial? Um, being, having that insight of being either a patient or the caregiver of, uh, of a patient with a paroxysomal disorder. So I'll kind of stop there with all those details and ha happy to take any questions along the way. Um, but let's talk about what, you know, I've talked about, you know, this, it's really important that you participate. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what participation looks like. So the first step here is to collect that preliminary data. And we're gonna be starting with these focus groups um, uh, next month, like in a few days. Um, so uh, the first focus group is gonna be on July 10th. The next one is going to be on July 14th. I mean, there's going to be writing about this, and so don't write this all down right now. Um, but first one is July 10th. Second one is July 14th. Third one is July 20th. Um, so that's going to be the 
big action item. I'm going to ask you to sort of, uh, you know, weigh in here and, you know, uh, when can you participate? Um, what are your preferences, you know, and a little bit about yourself so we can organize our focus groups accordingly. Um, once the focus groups are done, and we're hoping to get them done by this summer, um, you know, by winter of 2024, the beginning of the year, we're hoping to launch our survey, which we'll ask you to participate in. Um, and then that will sort of lead up to the meeting itself, which, like I said before, will be this kind of town hall discussion with families on uh, relevant topics. And we will organize based on the data that we get from the focus groups, as well as from the survey on, uh, uh, on how to organize it. Do we want to talk about specific symptoms or do we want to have a, a session on um, what it's like to be an older patient with a paroxysomal disorder versus younger patients? You guys are going to drive. Um, how that conversation goes. And that's why, you know, it's important to be there at the meeting, but it's really, really important to, to participate in that preliminary process as well, because it's going to be designed based on how you, uh, you know, how you give input on what's important to you. Um, so, like I said, moving on towards action items, um, we have just got, gotten, so we've, we've met with the FDA, they've given us uh, feedback on what how these focus groups should be conducted. We've just gotten institute, institutional uh, review board approval um, so that um, you know, we are conducting these focus groups in an ethical way. Um, so this is the flyer that we just got approved by, by our institutional review board, talking a little bit about you know, asking people to participate. And you can participate um, if you have, if you have a, if you are a caregiver, um, of, of a patient with any one of these disorders. Um, so any of the single enzyme deficiencies that we cover, if you have a patient, um, if you're the caregiver of a patient who has passed away, we still want to hear your voice. We still want to hear uh, what you have to say as well. Um, so the focus groups themselves are going to be, are gonna, like I said, July 10th, July 14th, July 20th. Um, we are going to allot about two hours for it. And I know that sounds like a lot, but you know, when you're talking in a conversation with um, about you know the the impacts of the disease that time goes really really fast. Um, so, but if we finish early, if we've covered everything that we want to cover before those two hours end, then you know obviously um, we will end earlier. So for the July 10th and the July 14th, we have these these uh, times set. Um, I was initially thinking of doing a, a similar time for July 20th, but in the survey that you're, I'm going to in the Google form, I'm going to ask you to take if you want. I've, I've scheduled it for 12 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. Um, but if you want it at a later time, I'm willing to uh, schedule a later time if that's more um, if that's more convenient for families, and you'll have an opportunity to share that. So I'll show you the screenshot of the Google form in just a second. Uh, so in these focus groups, again, you're going to be asking about what it's like living with a paroxysomal disorder. What are the daily impacts? What are the things that affect your child or you the most? Um, and then how do you manage paroxysomal disorders? And what would you like your clinical uh, what clinical trials to look like. And the last thing I will say with respect to, to before I get into, you know, showing you the link um, to participate uh, in this Google form so that we can find out your availability to participate is that, you know, and the research that has been done in both paroxysomal disorders and just all across the board, let's just talk about clinical research in general. Um, you know, scientists have sort of gotten it wrong for a number of decades and, you know, and really just kind of accepted the fact that a lot of times the clinical trial or not clinical trial, clinical research participation has been very homogeneous. And the problem with having, you know, a very homogeneous group of people participate in a study as a means to represent a larger population is that at the end of the day, the impact of that research will only affect the people that are in that sort of homogeneous group. So, you know, I, what I really want to, to like hammer into my research moving forward, starting, not starting, but including this is we really need diverse experiences from families. And I'm talking about different cultural backgrounds, different family structures, different, you know, uh, different income levels, different times in your journey of uh, your proxosomal disorder journey, um, you know, younger patients, older patients, we want it all because because the the more comprehensive we make it, the better all of this this data that we collect 
to inform these clinical trials is going to apply to the entire prostosomal disorder community. And all, like I said, you know, ZSD, it, we, the majority of the families here in our group are ZSD, but we have a lot of families from sing, that have single enzyme deficiencies, and we want to hear those, uh, those voices as well. So I encourage you, all of you to participate and try to encourage other people to participate as well, because the more voices we get, the more, the more information we'll have for the FDA. So let's, um, so, you know, I, I, this is just me, this is just me repeating what I just said, you know, your participation will definitely make a difference. You will be able to, um, you know, it, it, be able to give this information directly to the FDA. So that's why, you know, your participation is so important because you will have an impact on um, the development of new therapies for proxosomal disorders. So here's the action item. Um, there is a QR code that you can that you can uh, get, either get now. Um, I'll uh, when I go for questions, I'll put that QR code up. Um, if people are having ac problems accessing the QR code, I will um, during the question and answer session. I will. Um, uh, see if I can just drop the, the Google form link um, if anybody needs it. And in that Google form, you will be asked a couple of things. Um, and the most important uh, that we need is, well, actually we need all of these things. Um, we need your email address so I can invite you to participate in the focus group. Um, um, we need to know, you know what your current family situation is and I'll show you those questions in just a second. Um, one of the things that we really wanna know is, you know, it, it, has your child passed away or is your child still living? Because that's gonna sort of affect the, how we organize our focus groups. Um, uh, and then, um, the other, the other thing is that we're going to ask you is we're going to give you these dates and these times, and you're going to rank your first choice, your second choice, your third choice, and then we'll give you an opportunity to just put in, be like, I can't do this time, um, you know, and just what other, uh, any other information that you want to ask. So this is, these are some screenshots from the, um, from the Google form itself. And so it's, it's, it's going to give you three questions where you have one date, next date, third date. Um, and then it'll say, what's your first choice? What's your second choice? What's your third choice? I ask that you only choose, you know, your first choice for one and your second choice for two, for, for one and your third choice for another. Um, so try not to use the same answer choices over again, because that's, then it makes it difficult to sort of figure out what you want. Um, so, and then, so I, right now I've put July 20th as this 12 to 2 p.m. Eastern time in the Google form. But if you prefer a later evening um, uh, focus group on that date, then in that, do you have any other questions about participating in the PFDD process? You could put anything you want there, but you could also put a little bit more about your availability and we, we will try our best to accommodate you in the best, the best way that we can. So that's all I have. And I will leave this QR code up um, as uh, Katie facilitates some questions. Thank you so much for uh, your time. Um, Katie, I'm really sorry if I'm a little over. Um, You're but fine. This is such an important, um, such, an, such an important work that we're doing here. So this is the time to go over, make sure that everyone, I think everyone probably feels the same way, excited about this work that's happening. And this is the time that we can ask the question. So um, it's really okay to go over. We do have one question that I think you probably already answered, but I don't think there's any um, harm in just reiterating. Uh, nope. Do we participate in just one focus group in July? Um, not all of them correct. So I just wanted to reiterate that that's just, you know, available. There's three different ones because we want to make sure that we increase um, the opportunity for you to be able to participate in these focus groups. Um, so you would just select one. And as she said, you want you can literally say, this is my top choice. This is my second, second choice, third choice. And then um, I love that you shared also most of me that we can, you know, put notes in there. If I really want to participate, none of these dates are going to be able to work for me with my work schedule or caregiving schedule. Um, I also yeah. did drop the link into the chat box for you. So if everyone goes that. to the chat box, if the QR code's not working um, with your phone, or maybe you're watching this from your phone and can't and can't do it all at once, uh, there is a link in the chat box and we will be sending this out afterwards as well. Yeah, 
Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, so I have these three focus groups set and, you know, the when you're doing this type of research, a lot of times you'll get to the third focus group and you'll realize that, like, I feel like I'm missing some voices. I feel like I'm missing some perspectives. So there there very well may be another focus group that we are going to be doing um, in case that there we feel like there's anything that's missed. So definitely if, um, you know, we'd love for you, all of you to participate in these first three uh, focus groups and like Katie said it you only have to participate in one um, um, but if there is absolutely no way you can make any of these dates work let us know and then we'll we'll, we'll follow up to see what we can do um, you know after after July 20th and also I just think another uh, a great question that we can help clarify for our, our families and anyone who wants to participate is who can participate? We say caregivers, we say patients, those who actually have the disease, and then the caregivers who we often think parents. But what if there's a grandparent or an aunt and uncle who's very involved in the care of the individual that has a proxysome disorder, would they be able to participate as well? Yes. So if if you have if you have working uh, like if you interact with a patient with a paroxysmal disorder, you know, uh, as, as in an extended family capacity, anybody that provides care for a patient with a paroxysmal disorder, whether the patient or has provided care for a patient with a paroxysmal disorder can participate. If you feel like you have something to say, then we certainly want to hear that perspective. Now, if you are a patient with a paroxysmal disorder and that you want to participate in uh, in this process, it may not have these particular focus groups are meant specifically for caregivers, but we will have opportunities for patients uh, to participate if uh, if we have patients that uh, that want to share their story as well. And should those individuals reach out directly through this form um, still, or is there they like they can and you? they can and then in the other when when I ask family status or like what I think the question is says something like what best describes your family and it's and you say and you say I'm the caregiver of patient of, of a patient living with a paroxysmal disorder I'm a former caregiver of a patient who had passed away and then a, a couple other and then put in the other and just say I'm a patient um, and then we can uh, we can work uh, we can work from there. And my email, and if you have, if, if you're having trouble with the Google form or anything like that, my email is here uh, at the bottom. Um, one of my um, uh, graduate research assistants is also here on the webinar. Um, and uh, so she may also be contacting you um, with uh, additional information as well. And I, I just want to thank you again, most of me for sharing this information. I am so excited. I know our families and individuals with proximal disorders uh, are probably very excited about being able to use their voice and share this information um, during the drug development process. This is gonna be so crucial to our community. Um, and just reiterate again that, you know, there is a QR code on the screen right now. There's also a link in the chat box to be able to take that first step to be able to participate in this amazing work. Um, signing up for that focus group is step one. Uh, most of me, both will be in touch with you as soon as you put that information in um, to get you scheduled and use your voice, tell your story, make sure that they are taking the steps that are really going to make a difference and improve the quality of life for those with paroxysmal disorders. Um, to everyone that's listening tonight, thank you for participating. We will again be sharing all this information on Friday. Um, so just two days from now, we will send all of this out with links. Um, if you're for some reason you're having a tech issue and you just can't get that link to work or again, can't access that QR code. Um, there will also be a survey um, from this webinar. So um, please make sure you provide your feedback to the GFPD. Um, we do value your input on, on ways that we can educate and empower all of our families. So if there's no other questions, uh, thank you again, most of me for being with us and everyone else have a wonderful evening or day, depending on where you are located. Thanks, guys. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions.